everybody! In today's video I'm going to be showing you how I made a cooling vest. So a couple of months ago now my mother asked me if I could make her a cooling vest to go underneath her bee suit. So after a little bit of thought and a lot of procrastination I get it from her. I came up with this vest that has a bunch of pockets in it for some reusable ice packs. Now this would be useful for under a bee suit or under a mascot suit or if you have a big costume that you have to wear outside on a hot day. And I will say real quick before we start that I know this looks very difficult and it looks like a lot. It is a lot, but there's not really anything that was particularly difficult to do in itself. There were just a lot of steps and a lot of little pieces. Objectively, probably the most difficult part of this project was making and installing this bias binding, which is this trim that you see on the edges. But the good news is you can buy bias binding already pre-made, so that'll save you a step. So now with all that out of the way, if you want to see how I made this, then go ahead and keep on watching. Okay, so the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to make myself a little bit of a pattern. Now I have a vest pattern that I made a couple of years ago. So here's the back of that vest pattern. The front is very different and I think I'm going to wind up making the front almost identical to the back. And I got this pattern by copying one of my fiance's existing vests because I kind of like the shape. So I'm not even going to bother with a mock-up or anything because pretty much the only thing that I'm going to do with this pattern is I'm going to make it a little bit bigger. I'm going to make it a little less fitted, so this is probably going to come straight down, and I'm going to make it a little bit longer. So I'm not sure how much you can see on my camera, but basically what I did was I traced out this vest pattern. I added one inch to the center fold seam, so that's going to be cut on the fold, and it's going to add two inches, which is going to make it nice and roomy. Um, I added one inch of seam allowance to the shoulder because the idea is to do a French seam there. Instead of cutting the vest inward, I just cut it pretty much straight down. And I just guesstimated extending this by three and a half inches, which happens to be the uh, length of my ruler, which means, which means I used the width of my ruler to extend the length of it, and it happened to be three and a half inches. So that's how much longer this is going to be. And then I extended this side seam by one inch because I want to do a rolled hem for that. I extended this back hem by one inch to also do a rolled hem by that. My plan is to bias bind the arm face or the arm holes and the neck holes. So I didn't add any additional seam allowance to that. And the reason that I'm not closing up the sides is she requested that I put some little ties in there so that she can kind of adjust the sides if she needs to. So now my plan is to make a matching front. So what I'm going to do is cut this out and I'm going to use this to pretty much do the front almost exactly the same. I'm going to lower the neckline a little bit just to make it a little bit more comfortable to wear. Also similarly to how I extended this side seam by one inch, I'm going to do the same thing to the center front so that I can roll it under and have a nice rolled edge. And also that'll give the fabric a little bit more strength when I sew the zipper on later. So here are my pattern pieces. Here is the back, um, and I used that to pretty much trace out the front. I decided to lower the front by three and a half inches. Gee, I wonder why I picked that. Um, and then I actually got to use one of my uh, design curves for the first time, which is really exciting because I'm drafting patterns now apparently. Um, so I just curved this down a little bit. And my next step is to get this cut out. So here are my two pattern pieces laid out on my fabric. Um, this is exactly one yard of fabric, so this fits just about perfectly. So I'm just going to cut this out real quick, and I'm going to use my regular scissors instead of my picking shears, um, just because there shouldn't be any exposed edges on this anywhere. Okay, so the next step is to add in some pockets to hold these little ice packs. So the ice packs that I am using are Igloo Natural Ice, and part of the reason that I'm using these is because you can cut them um, to size. So they come like this, and then I just cut them in half like that. Um, and I also like these because they are pure water, so if one ruptures, it's just water, so it's not like it's, you know, harsh chemicals or anything. So I had to do a little bit of planning and a little bit of work to figure out how I wanted to do the pockets. So I measured these, um, and when I cut them in half, they happen to be about three and a half inches tall by about five inches wide. Now the problem is this is a 3D object, and this is a 3D object that can get kind of thick. Um, so I need to have a lot of extra room in the little pouch so that it can fit in there. So the way that I figured that out was I actually took that zipper, which I'm not sure if I'm going to use, um, and I just kind of loosely placed it over the uh, ice packs in a way that I think would fit and would ki get kind of a nice snug-ish kind of fit. And then I measured um, about how long that section of zipper was, and it wound up being about seven inches. So I took that 
um, five inches wide, added the two inches to get seven inches, so that's the extra room, and then I added another two inches, so that's one inch on each side to do some folds. Um, I'll show you when we get there, so that means it needs to be about nine inches wide. And for the height, I knew that I needed a little bit of extra room um, to gather the bottom. So for the height, I took three and a half inches tall. I added one inch to do a nice rolled um, finish at the top. And then I also figured that I would probably have to gather the bottom down so that I can actually sew the bottom to the vest. And now that I'm thinking about it, this 3D shape is also going to take a little bit of room in the uh, height department. So I'm probably going to add another inch to all of that. So instead of getting five inches tall, I'm probably going to need it to be about uh, six inches tall. So I'm going to need a grand total of 12 rectangles that are now going to be uh, six inches tall by nine inches wide. So I'm going to go ahead and get those cut out now. I'm also going to cut, take this opportunity to cut out some bias tape to do all of my binding. All right, so I have everything cut out. I've gone ahead and made my bias tape. So I'm going to start on some prep work. So the first thing I'm going to do is I am going to set up the gathering stitches for all of my little pockets. And the way that I'm going to do that is on each one of these, I'm going to mark one inch in um, from each side. And I'm going to do two lines of stitching, just parallel stitching across the bottom. And I'm going to use my longest stitch length, which happens to be four. And hopefully, since this will not be seen on the final pockets, I'm going to take this opportunity to use up some of my old bobbins because um, I'm going to go through a lot of thread really quick. All right, so my next step is to gather all of these down to eight inches. So the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to take this bias tape that I just made. I am going to cut eight inch strips of this. Maybe I shouldn't use bias because it'll stretch because I kind of don't want this to stretch. Should I? That would make my job a lot easier. Hold that thought. All right, so instead of using my bias tape, I decided that I would cut some eight inch by two inch strips on just the straight grain of my fabric. So as you can see, as I'm pulling, this does not want to stretch, um, which is different than bias tape, which as I'm pulling, it is going to want to stretch a little bit. So I just took these off of the iron, so I'm going to give these a couple minutes to cool down to kind of let that shape set. So now I'm going to show you how I bind these with our not bias bias tape. So on bias tape, there's usually one side that's a little bit longer than the other. There's usually one side that you can see both folds in, and then there's usually one side that you can only see this side. So the shorter side, this is the one that you're gonna want to put against the right side of your fabric. This is the one that you're gonna want on the outside, and you'll see why later. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to open this all the way up, and I'm opening on that shorter side, and I'm going to line this up, rough edges together, so raw edges together, and I'm going to put a pin here, on this corner because we're not doing any gathering there. Next I'm going to put a pin here on this corner so the material is going to bunch up a little bit. That's okay. That's what we're going for. Put another pin here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to flip it over. You can do it from the same side. I'm going to pull two strings for my gathering stitches and I'm just going to pull from both sides. Hopefully, if I can get oriented in this mess of string. And the way that I like to do my gathering is I like to pull shorter than what I need and then pull taut to match up to what I need. So now I am pulling and now my gathering matches up with the length of my tape. So now I'm just going to adjust the gathers a little bit, try to make them a little bit even. Um, I'm not going to worry too much about it. Um, and as you're adjusting these gathers, sometimes you might accidentally pull it a little too loose and you might have to tighten it up again. In theory, the way that you should do this is once you have your threads... Sorry, my house has been taken over by fruit flies, so if you see some of those flying around, that's why... Oh no, it came loose! This is also a lot easier to do when you're not talking to the camera. And you might have to fiddle with it a little bit. You might have to adjust it. So in theory, once you get the lengths of the string correct, what you're supposed to do, I never do it because it's a little fiddly and I'm fine with just fiddling around with it, is you're supposed to tie these two strings together in just a really simple double knot.
and that's going to lock the, um, and you do that on both sides, and that's going to lock the strings in the length that you need it to, so it's easier to adjust the gathers, and you don't have to worry about, like, pulling it. Um, I don't do that because I'm kind of lazy, but once you have your tape, so once you have everything kind of oriented the way that you want it to, you're going to start pinning, and I find it easier to pin as much as possible. So my goal is I want to sew from this side because that fold line is going to act as a guideline and I'm going to stitch my seam on that fold line. So I'm going to put in a fair amount of pins to try to hold my gathers where they're supposed to be. And this is where you really adjust and you nitpick. Ideally you'd use more pins than this, but it's but I'm pretty comfortable using cotton and cotton pretty much sticks wherever you need it to. So now I'm going to adjust my stitch length back down to a shorter stitch. I'm going to go like a little bit between the two and the three, closer to the two. And now I'm going to put this in my machine and stitch right on that fold line. So now the next step is to start to wrap the binding around. Um, so once you have this line of stitching, you can go ahead and clip away all of your other threads. Now, ideally, what you would do is you would press this, you take this to the iron, iron it down. You might even consider trimming this seam down a little bit. I'm not going to do that because I am lazy. So I'm telling you what you should do, but not what I'm going to do. So now the next step is to kind of reassemble this tape. And I'm going to make sure that I'm folding on this fold line as close as possible. I'm going to be concerned at the demonic sounds that are coming from my neighbor's house. So I'm going to fold this over and I'm going to pin it, but I'm going to pin it from the right side. And my goal is I want to make sure that this fold covers up that stitch line. So I may wind up coming back and trimming this down just a tad. And the reason that I'm going to do that is because once I fold this, and stitch it down. I'm going to stitch it from the top and I'm going to do a technique called stitch in the ditch. You don't have to do this. Um, I'm just going to kind of force myself to do it because I need to practice it and get better at it. But what you do to stitch in the ditch is you sew along that same stitch line and the goal is you sew in that little gap in between so that you don't see the stitches. So you're sewing within the seam. So that's why we need this to cover up that first seam because that first seam line is going to be the same line. So if this doesn't match up and if this doesn't cover up that seam line, then we're not going to catch that stitching from the front. So we need to make sure that it covers it so that when we're coming in from the front, it's going to catch. So here I have everything pinned from the front um, and I cannot see that stitch line, which means in theory, when I stitch in the ditch, it should catch on here and I shouldn't have any gaps. So I'm going to zoom you in a little bit and show you what I mean when I say stitch in the ditch. Here I have my stitch line and I'm going to start by lowering my foot and I'm going to start by hand lowering my needle because I really want to make sure that I'm hitting exactly in the right spot to make sure I'm perfectly in that ditch and I'm going to stitch very slowly. And ideally you would have ironed this and pressed it open, um, but I don't like doing that with this kind of tape because when you iron it open, often you kind of iron out the folds and then you wind up with a flat piece of fabric again and that's not what you want. Um, so I'm not <laughs> getting a very good stitch in the ditch in this. In theory, this is how you would do it. Um, I'm just not very good at it. So I kind of am making this decision on the fly to just do a very, very narrow hem with a very narrow seam allowance and just keep it as neat as possible. So that's my goal here. Oh no, I ran out of bobbin thread. All right, well, in theory, Here's what it looks like. It is not very neat. It is not very good. You know, we all have things that we're good at and we all have things that we're bad at. Um, for me, I am good at like estimating um, like how much like chocolate chips to add to things without measuring it. Um, I'm good at estimating that kind of stuff. I am really bad at stitching in the ditch and opening things. It's two things I absolutely cannot do and I have made peace with that. But anyway, point is, that is what I'm going to do to every single pocket, so uh, I'm going to be here for a while. Ooh, you know what? I should have done the top hem first. No, I lied. I'm going to take these to my iron, and I am going to do a half inch and then another half inch kind of rolled top edge to finish this off, and I'm going to do that first while all of this is still flat before it gets all bunched up. 
because uh, that, that would have been the smart thing to do. All right, so here I have my 12 pockets. So now my next step is to take this to my iron. I'm gonna go ahead and give um, this bound edge a nice quick press. I'm also going to fold over both sides by half an inch and also press those as well. Haven't decided yet if I'm going to properly sew these down by machine because this is where I'm going to sew it onto the vest itself. Um, so it's really just gonna come down to how lazy I feel if I'm gonna sew that or not. So I'm going to fold that under and press it on both sides sides. Okay, so here I have my pockets. They are nice and pressed. I decided I'm not going to go ahead and sew them because laziness. So when I have our little ice packs and I put them in, so when I sew these pockets down there's going to be a little bit of a gap at the top and um, I, I'm not a beekeeper so I don't know what kind of activities beekeepers do but um, I imagine there may be some bending over, some leaning over to, to pick up hives and combs and stuff. So I decided that I want to add in a little strap um, to kind of seal the ice in there. And so originally I thought I was going to do snaps, um, but that seems like a lot of hand sewing. And also the snaps that I have are either really, really obnoxiously big or really teeny tiny and fiddly. So instead I found this Velcro in my stash. So this is just some iron on Velcro. So I'm gonna basically make myself a uh, really long tube and turn it into some straps um, that I'm going to sew onto the vest. And then I'm gonna put some Velcro right here and then some Velcro on the underside of the tube, iron everything flat. And then there will be some little Velcro straps keeping the ice in. All right, so let me tell you what I mean by these tubes. So what I did was I went back to my fabric and on the straight grain, I cut some two inch strips. Then I arranged them right sides together and sewed a very narrow hem. I also kind of moved my needle over to help me to do that. And then every three inches, I made a mark. So I'm going to sew down there and I've already done it on this one. So the way that I'm gonna set this up is it's kind of like when you go to the grocery store and you pull those, um, like the produce bags and the bags for like your raw chicken and stuff. So basically what's gonna happen is this is a little extra. So I am going to trim this off real quick. Next I'm going to come down and I'm going to cut just to the right side of this bag. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna kind of make a little tube that I'm going to be able to turn right side out, press, get it all nice and uh, neat. And then once I have that, I'm gonna be able to iron on a piece of Velcro. Now make sure that your tubes are going to be wider than your piece of Velcro, otherwise they're gonna be kind of sticking out and they might catch on things and they might fall off later. But yeah, I'm just going to do this 12 times until I have these 12 little strips. And then we can start working on actually getting all of this onto the vest. Okay, so my next step is to start assembling all of the pocket pieces onto the vest. So here I have the front, so there's that kind of curved in neckline, there's the armhole. So what I did was I made a line one and a half inches in from the center. So that's hopefully gonna give me enough clearance once I have the one inch hem turned under once and then turned under twice and sewn down. That's gonna give me a little bit of wiggle room before I start hitting these pockets. So then I drew another line seven inches away from that and drew another vertical line. So those are gonna be my placement lines for lining up these three pockets. And then I made some horizontal lines on five inch increments. So I have a five by seven inch rectangle. I have three of those, they're all touching. So the first thing I'm going to do is sew on all of my little tabs. And I'm going to do that by going to my machine and sewing a little square on the, the piece that's going to get sewn down. I might use a zigzag stitch for these. I'm probably going to use a zigzag stitch for the sides of the pocket. That's just I don't know, in my mind, I feel like it makes a stronger seam. I don't know if there's any actual like evidence to that, but in my mind, I feel like that should work. So that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to sew my three tabs on first, and then I'm gonna come back and sew my pockets on. So the part of the fun thing about all of these in theory touching is I'm probably just going to do one very long seam along the sides and then come back and do the horizontal seams. So remember, you're only sewing the bottoms of the pockets. You need the tops open so that you can actually put the ice in there. So here's how I'm marking out the back. Hopefully you can see it. So I basically was able to draw a 14 by 17 rectangle across the back. So that allows me to have two pockets kind of side by side. Um, 
due to, you know, human error and not being perfect, there's going to be a little bit gap in between. Um, but I plan to have one inch of gap in between the three sections. So that's where those extra two inches comes from. So I'm going to do pretty much the same thing that I did on the front. I'm just going to stitch around in a box on all of the bottoms of all my tabs. And then I wound up doing the uh, not lazy thing and actually going around each pocket individually with my uh, zigzag stitch. All right, so here are my pockets sewn on. I'm just gonna let you see a little bit closer what I mean when I say sew a box. So you might be able to see my stitch lines here. They're in a box just on the bottom. So this little tab flap uh, is free and can flap and can move around and Velcro to this Velcro that I have ironed and attached to my pockets. So now I have my front and my back done. My next step is I am going to do up my shoulder seams. So I'm going to do these with French seams. So I am going to take the front sections to the back section and I'm going to first sew them wrong sides together. Then I'm going to trim it down, iron it, flip it, and then sew them right sides together. So that raw edge will be completely enclosed. So that'll close everything up nicely so it won't fray. And it'll also give the seam a little bit more strength, which it's gonna need because this is where a lot of that tension and a lot of that weight is gonna be pulling on. So here is what that shoulder seam looks like when it's finished. Here's the inside. So you can see that there are no raw edges showing. I've also gone ahead and kind of finger pressed this towards the back, that seam towards the back and then stitched it down. That's just to keep it nice and flat and all in one place. So while I was ironing this, I also took that opportunity to iron my hem. So my hem is ready to go to get rolled over once or to get folded over once, then folded over twice. So I'm going to go ahead and sew up my hem for all of my pieces. All right, so now it's time to start putting some finishing touches on our vest. So here's what we have so far. All right, so now it's time to start putting some finishing touches on our vest. Now I did a little bit of work off camera and I had a little bit of this bias binding left over. So I cut them into four equal pieces and I tied them to the sides. Um, I don't think I would really recommend using this bias binding because it's very thick and I'm having trouble getting a really tight knot. So my recommendation is if you are doing ties, I would recommend using ribbon. And a little pro tip for working with polyester ribbon, so it has to be like the cheap kind of ribbon, if you take a lighter, just a regular lighter, and just lightly kind of singe the ends, the ends will melt together and it'll stop the ribbon from fraying. So if you are interested in ties, what I would recommend is putting two sets of ties instead of just the one. And I would put a set further up and a little bit further down. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna reduce the chances of this kind of twisting around. So now really the last thing we have to do is install a zipper or some kind of other closure method to keep this front section closed. Now again, if you would like to do maybe some ribbon ties or if you'd like to do eyelets and lacing, feel free to do that. You can do that as well. I'm choosing a zipper because that was something that mom kind of asked me to do. So the trick here is you want to use a separating zipper like the ones that you find in jackets. Here's what the label kind of looks like. The sport part isn't that important. What is important is the word separating right here. So this was the zipper that I originally bought for this project and it's a little long. And the thing is with separating zippers, there's not really that much you can do to change the length of them. Because normally if you would change the lip of because normally if you need to shorten a zipper, what you would do is you would keep the top intact the way that it is because you need this little stopper, otherwise the zipper will fly off. But for separating zippers, it's the bottom that's really important. So you can't really cut that off or the zipper is not going to work right. So my first tip for picking a zipper is pick the zipper after you've made your vest so you know exactly how long it needs to be. And my second tip is for this kind of zipper, air on the side of slightly too short. So this is a 12 inch zipper. I was looking for a 14 inch one, but they didn't have one. So I picked the 12 inch instead. And if you wanted to properly install this with an actual zipper foot, you absolutely could. I'm going to show you kind of the cheating way to do it. And pretty much the only reason I'm doing it this way is because this doesn't have to particularly look nice. It just has to be functional. So now I'm going to install the zipper. So the first thing that I did was I turned my vest inside out. So this is the inside of the vest that we're looking at. So the first thing I'm going to do is line up my bottom and I want there to be a little bit of a gap. We may have to adjust this. We may have to adjust the gap. That's okay. That is something we can very easily do. So like I said, I'm going to do this in kind of the, the cheaty way. So what I'm going to do first is I'm going to make sure that my zipper is upside down. So this is the pull tab. This is what you want on the outside. So I'm going to flip that so that pull tab is on the bottom. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to line up 
my zipper teeth with the edge of this half of the vest and you're going to be able to feel it pretty easily. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to start pinning this zipper in place and the way that this worked out for me is this little seam allowance on my rolled hem is wider than my zipper tape so that's just going to give me a little bit of extra strength when I sew the zipper on. Another thing that I'm doing is I'm making sure that I'm only pinning through this layer of fabric and that I'm not catching any of the back of the vest through this. I'm feeling, pinning, and I'm going to pin and sew all the way up to the top of the zipper tape. So even though the zipper starts about an inch below the top of the tape, I'm going to sew all the way there. So now I'm going to make sure that the bottom of my vest is lined up. I'm just going to stick a pin to keep that. And now I'm going to do the same thing for pretty much the other side. I'm going to line up the teeth with the edge of the vest and I'm going to pin that on. Usually once you get the first pin in, it can get a little bit easier to pin. And if you need to pick this up and flip it around, feel free to do that. And really, once you get the first pin in, you don't need to worry about keeping them even anymore because that pin will keep it even. So here's what that looks like when it's done, and here's what it looks like on the right side. You may see a little bit of gaping, but that's just because the pins can't be everywhere at once. So now the next step is to actually sew the zipper in. So again, if you wanted to use a zipper foot and get right up next to the teeth, you can. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to worry about it. So there are a couple of ways you could go about actually sewing in the zipper. Kind of my first instincts and what I initially planned to do was to do a line of zigzag stitches along the tape. And honestly, that is probably what I'm going to wind up doing because I'm just kind of ready to get this done. If you wanted to keep your stitches a little bit neater and if you want it to look a little bit more professional and a little bit better, you can flip this right side out and sew this from the correct side or the outside. And you can line up your stitches either with this stitch line that we already sewed when we did this rolled hem. And if that stitch line is still on your tape, you can just sew right on top of that. Or you can just use that as a guide and do another line of very even stitches right next to it. But one thing I do want to make sure is I want to make sure that I do have a little bit of a gap between the teeth and between my stitch line. And the reason for that is with these separating zippers, I want this fabric to kind of gape out a little bit uh, once it's already sewn. So that way the fabric is less likely to get caught in these zipper teeth. So I am going to sew this from the wrong side because I'm okay with it not looking super neat and professional. And I'm going to sew all along the outside of the zipper tape. And the fun thing about these separating zippers and what makes them really easy to sew is you can just separate them and then it'll go into your machine nice and flat and you don't have to worry about fiddling with things under your machine. Another tip for working with a zipper is when you get close to this zipper pull, you might notice that it's hard to get this under your machine and it's hard to get your machine lined up the way you want to. So the way that you kind of work around this is just move the zipper pull up a couple of inches. Sew as normal. And once you've sewn a couple of inches, make sure that your needle is down pressing into your fabric. Lift up your presser foot and just unzip the zipper and move it back to the other side. Another thing to keep in mind when you're sewing these kind of separating zippers is this bottom edge on the non-zipper pull side is really important. This is what's going to have to go into the zipper pull to get it to work. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to cheat this a little bit out just to make sure that I have plenty of room to maneuver this around and to get it into that zipper pull. So instead of keeping this flush with the edge of the fabric, I'm going to cheat this out about a quarter of an inch and just sew that and secure it there. So now that we have our zipper sewn on, the next thing I'd recommend doing is just taking a couple minutes and playing with the zipper. So make sure you can easily get it in and out of the bottom. Make sure that it zips up really smoothly, that you're not going to have any issues with it. Because if you have issues with it, and if something, you know, if you're noticing that maybe you snag on the fabric at one point, it is worth it to take it out and rip it out and redo it now than to try to worry about it later. And if it takes you a couple of tries to get the zipper in, don't worry, it's not you. Zippers are tricky. Even people who have, you know, 15, 20, 30 years of sewing experience get tripped up by zippers sometimes. Honestly, at the end of the day, all you need is the zipper to be securely attached to the vest in a way that it works and it zips up and down, and this gets the job done. And right now, the last thing that I'm going to do is go around the vest and clip any loose threads that I may have. And then we are done. And that was how I made this vest. So again, like I said, there was nothing particularly difficult about making this. It's just a lot. 
So a couple of things I don't remember if I really mentioned throughout the process of making this video. If you wanted to make this, I would recommend making it out of some sort of cotton or other kind of natural fiber material because polyester based materials don't tend to breathe really well. So they're not gonna cool you as efficiently as these natural fiber materials will. Also, these tabs are pretty good at keeping these ice packs in their container. Sometimes they do slip out or one or two will slip out, but it's better than not having them at all. Also, the warnings on a lot of ice packs, especially ice packs that are used for injuries, tell you to not put them on bare skin. And there are a whole bunch of like warnings about all of these things about not wearing ice packs against your skin for extended periods of time. So, you know, don't, uh, don't come after me. <laughs> I'm just showing you how to make it. Whether or not you make it and wear it is entirely up to you. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope I broke everything down enough for you to be able to make this if you so choose. If you are interested in more sewing content, please consider subscribing to my channel. I do mostly kind of vintage reproduction pattern reviews. If you're interested in seeing behind the scenes, sneak peeks, and things that don't always make it to YouTube, feel free to give me a follow over on Instagram, over at Thread and Needlefish. That's where I post all these kind of behind the scenes things. And that's it for this video, and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye!